final thing I want to talk about in the series of videos for today's lecture is the, the transfer function. Um, and you can write down the transfer function corresponding to a gi uh, given uh, difference equation directly from the difference equation. So, so taking this difference equation we had in this previous problem Originally, it was given like this, equal 4 x of n plus 2 minus 3 x of n plus 1. Uh, we can write down the, the difference, uh, the transfer function uh, almost directly, um, you know, taking the z transform of, of both sides of this equation. Uh, ignoring the initial conditions. The initial conditions are set to zero when determining the transfer function. I get 2z squared minus 3z directly from the advanced form. So the advanced corresponds to multiplication by z plus 1, all b times y. And then here I'd have 4z squared minus 3z all times x. And then so my transfer function is the ratio of y to x. And so I immediately get uh, 4z squared minus 3z over 2z squared minus 3z plus 1 for my transfer function. And you can see that the coefficients of y and the corresponding advances determine my uh, denominator, so I've got 2z squared minus 3z to the first power plus 1 with z to the 0 power or 1. And then on the numerator, I have 4z squared minus 3z. And you might ask, well, what about if I'm giving the, the difference equation in the delay form? Uh, and similar procedure find it a little easier to find the transfer function from the advanced form, but you can do it from, from either expression, of course, you should be able to convert back and forth between the, the um, advanced and delay forms uh, of the equation. So here we would have 2y of z minus 3z to the minus 1 uh, plus z to the minus 2 all times y is equal to 4 minus 3z to the minus 1 all times x. Again, remember a delay of 1 corresponds to multiplication by z to the minus 1. And so again, I get h of z is the ratio of y to x or 4 minus 3z to the minus 1 over 2 minus 3z to the minus 1 plus z to the minus 2. Now it looks a little different from the expression above, but if I write this in terms of uh, polyno ratio of polynomials in z, I can, uh, to get that, I need to multiply the numerator and denominator by z squared. I'll get 4z squared minus 3z in the numerator. And in the denominator, I'll have 2z squared minus 3z plus 1. So exact same transfer function, fortunately. So it doesn't matter whether you use the advanced form or the delay form. You'll get to the same transfer function. Um, in the, it, given the transfer function of, of a system, you can then find the, the forced response or the zero state response for any input. I don't have to go back to the, the difference equation. Once I have the transfer function, I can then find the output of that system for, for any input just by multiplying the, the transfer function times the z transform of the input and finding the inverse tra transform uh, uh, to, get the, to get the output sequence. I don't have to work through all this algebra again, um, uh, starting from the difference equation define the force response. 
Um, you know, it's a little work to get the, the transfer function, but you know, once we have it, it tells us a lot about the system. Um, in this particular case, uh, um, we can write our, our h of z as uh, z 2z minus 3 halves. Then I can factor that denominator as z minus 1 half and z minus 1. Um, you know, so if I were to do a, a pole 0 plot of h of z, remember z is actually a complex variable, and so h of z is a complex function of a complex variable. So if I were to, I'd really need to plot um, you know, the magnitude of h of z um, in some sort of three-dimensional surface over the z-plane, but I can get some insight into what the, what the uh, system, the transfer function looks like just from the pole zero plot. And in the pole zero plot, I just put uh, little zeros on, my, on the complex plane at the zero locations of the, the numerator. And so one zero location is at, at z equal to zero. Um, and the other zero location, I set this term equal to zero. I get 2z is equal to 3 halves, or z is equal to um, plus 3 quarters. So if I call that 1 plus 3 quarters, is going to be about right there. And then I've got poles, in this case, real poles at, if I call this 1 about that same distance, I have one pole at z equal to, oops, uh, the poles are all positive here. Have a pole at uh, z equal one half, and this was at three quarters, so pole equal one half, and then a, a pole at z equal to one in this case. Okay. Um, uh, we will find that when we discuss stability of our uh, discrete time sequences, that uh, a term, a pole term like this, corresponds to a, a sequence of uh, one half the n, n u of n. That's a decaying sequence, and so that's going to be a sequence that, that dies away. This actually would lead to a u of n term, a unit step term that, that doesn't die away. Um, the condition for stability that we'll talk about is in order to have a stable discrete time system, um, poles must lie within the unit circle. So that's a circle in a complex plane of radius 1 for stability. So again, don't confuse this with our continuous time sequence where for the continuous time or continuous time system for for the continuous time system, poles had to have lie in the left half of the complex plane, or had to have a, a negative real part. For discrete time systems, the poles of the transfer function have to lie within the side the unit circle for stability. Uh, um, here, we actually have a pole at one half, which is inside the unit circle. But our second pole is actually at z equal minus 1. So this system is not bounded input, bounded output stable. In terms of asymptotic stability, we'll find that it's actually marginally stable. But it's not, it doesn't meet our bounded input, bounded, bounded output definition of stability because we've got a, a pole here on the unit circle. And uh, all the poles here are in the right half plane in this particular example, that, that's not really relevant. I could have a, um, a poles here on the, in the left half of the plane, and, and as long as they lie within the unit circle, I might have a complex conjugate pair of poles. Uh, we'll have that if we have a second order polynomial in the denominator again. Those poles will always occur in complex conjugate pairs for the transfer functions that we deal with. So I could have you know, a complex conjugate pair of, of zeros even 
um, that aren't uh, located on the real axis, as in this, this example. Um, the zeros can be anywhere. They don't affect stability, but my poles have to lie within the unit circle for uh, this bounded in input, bounded output uh, criterion.